Shadows of Evil is a masterpiece. It doesn't get the credit it deserves, an extremely underrated map. This map kicked off Black Ops 3 Zombies, and with the new zombies came new players, and new players didn't like the complexity that Shadows of Evil offered. Whether it was beast mode, or the amount of parts you had to grab, or the rituals, people didn't like it. Initially, I was one of those people. I'd rather play the Giant, a familiar map that I could understand easily. Shadows is not a map you want to hop on if you're not experienced in Zombies, which is why it was such a poor launch map. But as time went by, people grew more and more fond of it and started giving it the respect it deserves. I don't think Shadows is the best map ever, but objectively, I think it is a top five map, and I also think it's the best designed map, and it did so many things right, despite all of the backlash it received in its early stages. The map takes place in fictional Morgue City, based off of real life Chicago in the 1940s. The glitz and the glamour of this era really captivate you, and the jazz music complements it very well. Personally, I love jazz music, and it's very soothing to me. The atmosphere is just fantastic fantastic, and the setting is super unique, and plus a city is a very realistic setting, a very relatable setting. There are many references to the Prohibition, like the bootlegger gun, and many quotes the characters say. Speaking of characters, there were four new ones. A brand new cast, we got Nero Blackstone, Floyd Campbell, Jackie fucking Vincent, and Jessica Rose. All of which, residents of Morgue City, Jackie being a police officer, Floyd being a boxer, Nero being a magician, and Jessica being an actress. Not everybody likes this cast, but personally, I do, and it's a immediately clear what all of their roles are. The intro cutscene explains everything about the map, really. The four characters are sinners, and they're sent to this nightmarish realm of Shadows of Evil, this alternate version of the city where zombies reside, in order to pay for their sins. The intro cutscene summarizes all of the characters' past and explains why they are in Shadows of Evil. Jack Vincent is a crooked cop and cuts deals with criminals to let them loose, accepting money from them. But the mayor of the city picks up on this and sets out an investigation. Jackie panics and kills all the criminal associates to hide the evidence. Jessica is a dancer at the Black Lace Burlesque and aspires to be a Hollywood actress, and in order to do so, actually dates a film producer. The media catches on, taking photographs of them, and in order to hide that, kills the film producer she is dating. Lloyd's a boxer and has a shot to become the number one contender by defeating Tony King, but the problem is he hasn't boxed in a while, so he puts brass knuckles under his gloves and kills the man to win. And then there's Nero, by far the most interesting of the four characters. Used to be the best magician in the world, but then becomes the worst magician in the world for unknown reasons. But the problem is, he needs to pay his bills. And on top of that, he has a demanding wife that spends his money recklessly. So, he kills her in order to collect her life insurance, killing two birds with one stone. Blackstone. Stone. Holy shit, I just solved an easter egg. Unlike the Chaos crew, the Shadows crew's past is immediately clear and also pretty interesting. And fairly in depth for being on one single map. They're not characters that you just shrug off and forget. These characters stick. And there are even many conspiracy theories about these characters, like Floyd being a sailor or Nero's affiliation with the devil. And there was even speculation that Jessica may have been Finn O'Leary's ex-wife. And Jackie even talks about Finn O'Leary in some of his quotes. Shadows of Evil takes place roughly around the same time as Mob of the Dead, which is why why they're so similar and why there are so many ties between the two. The entity behind all of this craziness is the Shadow Man. He brought them into this alternate universe, directs them to complete all of the four rituals, but then tricks them, stealing the summoning key. An emphasis to steal back the summoning key from the deceiving Shadow Man creates the Easter egg. But upon completion, Richthofen snatches it away for his own means. The Easter egg on this map is substantial and fairly difficult, but with good coordination and an ounce of skill, you can get it done. It does require four players, which is good for some players, bad for others. Regardless, it's a team effort and is very rewarding. It gives you a calling card. It gives you a lot of XP. And the conclusion is great because at first you don't really understand it, but then when you hear Richtofen talking about this special artifact he acquired in the giant later on, it becomes clear that he needs this for the journey he's about to go on. So it gives you a nice head scratcher at first, but then you figure it out pretty quickly, which gives you the perfect balance of mystery and conclusiveness. The Bright Light City is already intriguing, but Treyarch takes it a step further by blending in the HP Lovecraft elements and creatures. These horrific fictional creatures like the Margwas, Parasites, and Meatballs are thrown in and, you know, makes an already unique map even more unique. And it also extends itself to the player. In fact, most of the map has to be opened via beast mode, which is some sort of giant tentacle squid thing. Which, granted, may be a turnoff for many people. Lots of people just like turning on a switch for power, but we'll get to that later. Like I said earlier, the city is relatable. You could picture yourself living in one of these very buildings. And when it's toppled with Apothecary 
lore, references to Cthulhu, and all of these tentacles, it gives me the perfect balance of uncomfort and curiosity, which is what zombies should feel like. You shouldn't feel comfortable all the time. You should feel compelled to search the map, which is what Shadows of Evil is all about. On top of all of the Apothecan stuff, and the conspiracies, and everything else that's mysterious about the map, there are tons of side Easter eggs that are very subtle, but clearly not impossible to pick up on. There's the free Gobblegum Easter egg, there's the Trip Mine Easter egg, the little Arnie upgrade, there's also the music Easter egg, which blasts jazz music throughout the whole map, which just feels so awesome. There's probably even more that I'm failing to mention, plus all of the ciphers that Jason Blundell says we haven't even dug up yet. It just feels like there are endless things to discover about this map. It makes you appreciate every fine detail of the map. Every fucking pixel feels important. There isn't an ounce of wasted space. And speaking of space, let's talk about the map design. The real reason why I think Shadows of Evil is a masterpiece. The map has a perfect balance of complexity and simplicity, and when I say simplicity, I mean, it's very straightforward. There are four districts, right? Each dedicated to a character. There's the Footlight District, which is dedicated to Jessica. There's the Waterfront District, which is dedicated to Floyd. Then the Canals District, dedicated to Jack. And then you have the center of the map, which is revolved around Nero. There's a ritual in every single district. You just have to go and complete all four of them to get to Pack-a-Punch. Each district has its own theme revolved around the character in which it's dedicated to. So for example, the Waterfront District around Floyd is the boxing gym. In the junction, you have Nero's Lair where he performs his magic tricks. In the Footlight, where Jessica resides, there's the Black Lace Burlesque, where she works. And in the Canals District, there's the Ruby Rabbit, where Jack kills that dude outside of. The four distinct areas of the map make it very easy to follow. This is also notable in maps like Shinonuma and Nine. And every district is super balanced. Everything in the map is divided equally amongst the districts. There's a perk in every district, a shield part, a fuse, a squid statue for the sword, a train station, a good wall gun or two, a mystery box, pods, fountains. I could go on and on. This balance makes you feel like you can go anywhere on the map and have an equal chance to survive. There's not one outstanding part of the map. Sure, some training spots are more viable than others, but I feel like I can be anywhere and still have a great time. Below the surface of all of these districts is by far the biggest section of the map, the Rift, where you get Pack-a-Punch, where Widow's Line is located. It's very spacious, great for training. This room is great for survival. It has just about everything you need. The map is very large, but transportation is very easy. There's a train that can go all throughout the map, and if you want an even quicker and more efficient way, there are teleporters that you have to open up. So the map feels huge and expansive, but you can also revive players pretty quickly, especially through beast mode. You can get from point A to point B without stressing too much. Spacing on a map is everything, and I think this map nails it, especially for what it was going for. In every district, there's one prominent training area with a bit of space, but other than that, everything feels condensed. There are tight corridors and small alleyways, which is exactly what a city would feel like, which makes the space feels so balanced. And then the rift where there's tons and tons of space, there's still that wall run you always gotta risk your life to jump on. And the zombie spawns in that room are fucking crazy, so you never really know where they're gonna be coming at you from. My point is Shadows of Evil has checks and balances. Some maps lack balance entirely. For example, Ascension, right? You have five huge training areas with a thunder gun, pretty much invincible. And there's nothing to bring it back down to earth. The monkeys do create some challenge, but really all you need is jugs, so they don't actually balance out the map. It becomes far too wide open and far too unbalanced. So I think the spacing, the size, and the sectionality of this map make it a great map design. And on top of all of this, you have the small details, you have the decorations. Really, I encourage you to just go into theater mode and look around the map. You will seriously be amazed by how beautiful it is. Now that we've talked about some of the backstory and the theme and the map design of Shadows of Evil, let's talk about the pure gameplay because let's be honest, not everybody is here to look at a great map. People want some good gameplay. You spawn in a very small room with a given task, complete all four rituals and get to Pack-a-Punch. So you hop into beast mode and start opening up the map. Beast mode is a clear spin-off of Afterlife, which we saw on Mob of the Dead, another quality that both of these maps share, by the way. So this concept of turning on everything individually instead of flipping a switch isn't brand new, but still feels unfamiliar. And though for many players, beast mode feels tedious and unnecessary, but there are a couple pros to beast mode. One, it makes you a more efficient player, and two, it allows the player 
player to control what parts of the map they keep on or off. If there's a specific door I want to keep closed, then I won't open it. If there's a specific perk I want to keep off for some reason, I just won't turn it on. It grants you a little bit more freedom despite it being a little more tedious. Beast mode would be a problem if it didn't work properly, but it works properly and plus we have tons of other maps that just require one switch to turn on the power. You need maps like Shadows to sort of mix things up. Plus in beast mode you can kill zombies, you can navigate the map quicker, you can revive players, you have instant protection. So though some players think it's annoying and stupid to open up everything individually, I think it's actually really healthy for the map. Upon completion of the first two rituals, a Margwa will spawn in, which is, needless to say, terrifying for the first time, but assuming you've seen a Margwa before and know to shoot the three heads to kill it, it is great. It gives you a ton of points, which further progresses the upgrading because you can go open up more doors now to complete the other rituals. Plus, it gives you a Margwa's heart for the Apothecan Servant. And personally, I think the Margwa is one of the best bosses in Zombies. I think it adds a perfect level of minor chaos to the map. When it spawns in, you definitely freak out for a sec. You know, your heart drops. But well, then he starts walking towards you, you can sort of train him with your zombies and keep him in control, and with a bit of good aim, you just slowly start taking out his head. He can insta-down you without jug, you know, he's a big boss, he is a presence to behold, but he also gives you a great reward, and he doesn't spawn in that often. Contrastly, I think the parasites are fucking annoying, there's way too many of them and they're constantly shooting me, and granted, they don't emit tons of damage, but I would just prefer if they reduced the number of them. And the meatballs are pretty much insignificant, in fact, if they took those out of the map, I don't think anyone would care. But they're not bad bosses. After completing the four rituals, you head down to the rift, complete the final ritual, and then you have Pack-a-Punch. Everything from there on is optional but probably a good idea to do. The majority of players will then try to acquire the Apothecan Sword, the specialist of the map. You go around on the train, find the three symbols, bring it back downstairs, plug them in, and then you have the Apothecan Egg. Then you take that egg, you bring them to the four individual squid statues in the districts, feed them with the souls, and then you're good. You just bring it back down and you have the Apothecan Sword. Now this is a bit of a lengthy process, but again, this is 100% optional. You don't even have to do this to have a fun time. It just gives you an added bonus, an added strength, because really in every Black Ops 3 map, as long as you have a double papped weapon, it's infinite rounds until your game crashes. But this sword just gives you an extra task to do in case you're bored of just completing the four rituals. Some people then choose to take it a step further by upgrading the Apothecan Sword by completing the four Margo rituals around the map with the Arc Ovum. Again, this is a completely optional task. You don't have to do this. It just gives you more to do and gives you a bonus for doing it. It doesn't harm the core survival. On some of the Black Ops 4 maps, it seems like tasks like these are mandatory, which adds pressure to the player and makes them anxious. But for the most part, when I play Shadows, depending on who I'm playing with, me and like one other person will grab the upgraded sword just for something to do, and the other casual people will just sit back and use their papped weapon. Also, what I appreciate about this map is grabbing fuses for the civil protector and shield parts and other small things like that don't feel like a chore. They just kind of naturally happen. Like if I'm around 30 and I'm just training, I'm figured, well, I may as We'll go grab the fuses now you know the silver protector might help me a little bit and the shield parts are in very easy to find locations each in one district which makes it also very easy to find now in terms of actual survival on the early rounds you're not struggling on a map like zetsubo you tend to struggle because of how many doors you have to open and how little you have to work with but on this map you're constantly getting small rewards a lot of points for killing the margwas the boss rounds are pretty easy the pods in themselves can give you upgraded weapons and all this cool shit so instead of feeling starved on a map like ZNS, I feel full on a map like Shadow. In a solo game, I always have Pack-a-Punch open by round four, and beyond that, I grab the Apothecan Sword and everything else I need. To have everything entirely set up on solo is usually about round 15 for me. To have everything upgraded, to have the Apothecan Servant, it usually takes some time, probably about 45 minutes if we're being honest. But again, as I'm a broken record here, a lot of the shit I do is not necessary. It just takes 10 minutes to have everything set up for a casual person just by opening up Pack-a-Punch. The Wonder Weapon of this map, the Apothecan Servant, is a godlike wonder weapon, and once again, shows why Shadows is such a balanced map. It has infinite damage. It's nearly impossible to die with this wonder weapon, but the catch is, you don't have a ton of ammo, which is a huge drawback. Now, Black Ops 3, you got Alchemical Antithesis, so you pretty much have unlimited ammo, but besides that, it's a balanced wonder weapon. It does require some thought to grab it, but once you complete that, and let's say you accidentally trade it out or something, you can just grab it from the box, which is a great idea. Plus, we get to fist 
missed it real good. Alongside the Apothic and Servant, you have Little Arnie's, which are an alternative to the Monkey Bombs. They attract the zombies, except the Little Arnie's actually do far more damage. They kill probably up to 50 zombies a throw. Little Arnie's have to be one of the best wonder gadgets in zombies history. Probably the best, honestly. And if you're bored on high rounds, you can just upgrade these things. You can throw them at the three locations you need to around the map. You can watch the Little Arnie things dance, which is a fucking blast, right? And then you have upgraded Little Arnie's. They do more damage. You get a ammo replenishment. It's it's nothing but good. So let's see what we're looking at here with a full setup. You got an upgraded Apothecan Sword. You got upgraded Little Arnie's. You got the Apothecan Servant. You got a Rocket Shield. It's gonna be a fucking blast of a game. Again, these are lengthy processes, but as long as you have the bare minimum of double pack-a-punch on a weapon, you have pretty much as equally a good of a chance of survival. You got Widow's Wine, you got the Civil Protector who can actually revive you when you down on solo, you have the Chain Trap, you just have so much to work with, and none of it is even necessary, and it, that, that's what makes it such a good experience for everybody. Casual people can enjoy it. Maybe not at launch, but casual people can get used to it and enjoy it. Hardcore people are in love with this map. And that is why I think Shadows of Evil is a masterpiece. And I believe that Treyarch worked hard on this map, probably harder than any map they've ever developed. This is Treyarch's gem, their baby, and it's so apparent. The map is beautifully designed. The story is fascinating and not impossible to learn. And every time I hop in this map, I feel like I'm learning something new. There are tons of things I even forgot to mention in this video. One, the laundry Easter egg, right? You go up to that little laundry mat next to spawn, throw the grenade, 500 free points. Perk jingles are also different on this map. Like everything about this map screams unique and I love it. Guys, please let me know what your thoughts are on Shadows of Evil. I'm going to make a couple more of these style videos for a couple different maps. That will be a surprise, but I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, make sure to leave a like and subscribe. I hope you have a fantastic day and uh, yeah, that is it. Hope you have a great day. Fuck, said that already. Bye. <laughs>